Welcome, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to invite Catherine to our conversation this week. Um, when you travel as much as I know Catherine does and, and I do, you go to places in the world and people say, do you know Patrick Holden? Do you know Vandana Shiva? <laughs> when I went to San Francisco, everyone said, do you know Catherine Couch? Um, so she spoke to us last year about her work with the series project, which is brilliant and perhaps deserves a five minute overview or seven. Um, but everything you're doing with the healthcare system is, is really, really impressive. And I'm really looking forward to your presentation, so. Awesome, yeah. thanks so much, Dan. Um, yeah. Really happy to be here with all of you. And um, um, <clears throat> we'll get the PowerPoint up um, while I'm just doing a little introduction. So what I'm hoping to do is cover uh, four kind of different but related things um, in the next hour or so. I'm gonna start with an overview of the work that we're doing at Ceres and how we really envisioned and developed a holistic and community-based model for connecting food and health. Then I'm gonna share a framework for how to think about food as medicine, which is a term that lots of people are throwing out these days um, and some data that really supports that connection. Then I'm gonna switch gears and talk a little about the momentum that is building around the country to incorporate food as a covered healthcare benefit and why, what's driving that and why it matters so much and, and how we can leverage that. And then finally, um, I'm gonna wrap with some ideas that I think are important for all of us to think about and talk about if we're to really realize the full opportunity of this moment, um, including for the health and resilience of our communities and food systems. So next slide, please. So I'm gonna start with an overview. So Ceres Community Project is a, a nonprofit based in Sonoma County, California. We um, serve the two counties north of San Francisco, about 2,500 square miles. And um, the organization was started in two, 2007 with kind of a dual mission, which was to teach teens how to cook healthy food and support community members who are dealing with a serious illness. And um, when I had the original idea, for series, I was really um, thinking a lot about uh, kind of what was happening in our world. And on the one side, on the teen side, really, um, you know, concerned about the demographic changes that had happened over the last couple of generations and how many young people were growing up in families where cooking doesn't happen. And what was the consequence of that for their lifetime health? And then I also knew, which you know, many of us certainly at, at my age um, have had this experience, but when people get sick and most need to eat well, it tends to go to the bottom of the list for a whole host of reasons, including money and not feeling like eating and um, stress and just all the other complexities that happen during illness. Um, and so the idea was to bring those two, two together. And we started in a church kitchen um, in 2007. Um, it was my one day a week volunteer project. And um, we worked with about um, six or eight teens and started by cooking for four families. So here, you know, now we have, um, we run two organic gardens that are youth, youth led and youth run organic gardens. And we have three commercial, commercial kitchens in two counties. Um, we engage about a uh, thousand volunteers a year. And, um, and last year, partially driven by COVID, delivered almost 184,000 meals. We also support um, eight affiliates around the country and in Denmark, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So next slide. We do four different things. Um, and um, we started with the first couple and, and have expanded since then. So we nourish people and we nourish clients with healthy 100% organic meals that are delivered to their homes. Meals are tailored to meet the nutritional requirements of their illness. And I'll circle back around uh, to talk a little more about that later. We provide meals for everyone in the family. We've, we've done that since the beginning and, and just the, rea the reality that if we don't support the whole family, we know that we're not really relieving stress in that, in that moment of illness. But more importantly, if our ultimate goal is to drive dietary change, if we don't bring the whole family along, that's not gonna be sustainable. Um, and we, we also nourish people in other ways, which you'll see, but um, you know, we're a program that's really based on the idea that, um, that our 
kind of deepest human values are to to care for one another, to be generous, um, uh, to be heart centered, and um, and that nourishes all of us in lots of different ways. Um, next slide. We empower people, and this photo is really you know looking at our youth program, but we believe empowerment is really central in this work, right? That one of the one of the things that's happened in the industrial medical system is we no longer believe that we have the power to care for ourselves. We, we have something wrong with us. We go to the doctor, what's the pill I can take for that? And as you'll see in a slide later, the reality is that the majority of our health is actually in our hands. And it's really about the choices we make every day. So a lot of our work is around um, connecting people back to their own agency and their, and their sense of their ability to make a difference for themselves and for the people around them. Um, next slide. Um, well, I'm going to say one more thing about the youth program. So our youth program provides what we call soil to community food system education, skills in growing and preparing healthy food, and um, job training and leadership development. And youth are about 14 to 22 who are in that program. So the third thing we do is connect people. And um, if you've heard any of my other talks, I, I almost always talk about this, which is that um, when the research around social connection is really um, interesting and basically what it says is if we feel cared for and connected to others we are 50 percent more likely to be alive an average of eight years later than if we feel disconnected and alone and that being the feeling that the feeling of disconnection is as bad for our health as being obese or smoking uh, 15 cigarettes a day so that's a pretty profound connection and so the entire series model is really about strengthening social connection. So we connect to our clients, we, um, we bring youth together to be, feel like they can make a contribution to others. Um, we engage many, many volunteers and community partners and our belief, and the research really backs this up, is that um, all of us who are involved with series are healthier as, as a result of being involved in the program, right? Because we're all, we're all connected in these meaningful ways with one another and that nobody in our program is only a giver or only a receiver, right? Our clients give us the opportunity to care for them and that is good for us too. And so we're all in this cycle of giving and receiving, which is really what the human condition has always been. And we've just kind of lost our way from that. The last thing that we do, which is, which is really, um, you know, maybe not completely new, but, but certainly much, a much bigger part of our work over the last four to five years is that we advocate. So we have really moved into the space of policy and advocacy, and, and that's a lot of what I'll talk about later, but we have really leveraged our experience at the community level to help scale solutions, to advocate for systems and policy changes that support a healthy, just, and sustainable world for everyone. Um, next slide. So I just have a couple brief slides um, with some quotes from, from clients. So the population that we serve, and I think this is also really important, there's a lot of, of food as medicine interventions happening in our world and lots of new for-profit companies that are doing healthy meals and, and deliver them to your home. But the clients that we work with are primarily on Medicaid and Medicare. 77% of them are living on less than $32,000 a year for two people. 73% are living alone with no family or caregiver support, 68% are over 60, and 27% are BIPOC. This is a population that um, is carrying the brunt of health disparities in our country and, um, and where we're seeing elevated levels of chronic disease. And without interventions that are provided either philanthropically or by the kinds of changes that we're talking about in the healthcare system, th this population is, is not going to have better outcomes. Um, it is not going to be included in the food as medicine movement. Next slide. So our youth program, um, we, as I said, um, it's a really robust program um, that includes a lot of hands-on learning in our gardens and kitchens. There's also a curriculum that we offer on every shift every day that includes broader kind of food system issues or yeah, issues. Um, we also have a leadership pathway. So the two teens that you're seeing in the, in the foreground of this picture are both teen leaders. So they've been in the program for at least a year. 
um, and they really play a leadership role and peer educator role in the program. Um, we're obviously doing job training, um, and then there's this, you know, really, really large piece. Um, if you think about 14 to 19 year olds, you know, it's the age when you're when you're you're starting to move away from your family of origin. You're trying to find your place in the broader community. And really the fundamental question is what are my values and how am I going to express those values in the world around me? And we really, you know, most kids spend most of their time with their peers, their family, and in school. And we're not really creating these opportunities for young people to have a real authentic role in serving their community. And we have found that it is a profound experience for them um, to be in these positions where they are really leading the work to nourish their community. And we bring clients in on a regular basis to talk with them. And that there's a huge piece that, that develops then around self-esteem and agency and, um, and um, also in you know, helping shape careers. So we do a lot of data collection of series and I'll just talk just for a minute about the data we have for alumni. So every couple of years, we go out and survey all of the youth who've been out of the program for two years or longer. Um, and here's what we find. 78% are eating mostly a whole foods diet. 47% um, are cooking from scratch at least four times a week. And you know, usually I'm in front of uh, audiences of adults who are not that into cooking. And so I was like, how many of you can say that? I mean, it's usually not very many. 60% um, are engaged in community service in some way. And 95% say that their time on, at Ceres was really influential in, um, in that. And 58% are studying or working in fields related to our work. So that's sustainable agriculture, culinary, um, nutrition, medicine, public health, community organizing. And 78% say we were influential. So we know we're having a really long-term um, impact on young people and really helping to shape the way that they're engaging with the world. Um, next slide. We are also very, very involved in nutrition education. And that started with um, work that we do with our teens and also with our clients as they're part of the program. Um, over the years, we've done lots of different kinds of programming, um, including, and often people will ask me, so our program is 24 weeks, so clients can get 24 weeks of service. You know, what happens at the end of those 24 weeks? And we were very concerned about this early on um, in the program. And in 2009, we published a cookbook so that we had a resource we could share with clients when they left the program and also to share with people who we can't serve for a variety of reasons. Um, but we've also tested many kinds of transition programs for clients, including uh, nutrition education and culinary classes, um, CSA boxes that we deliver to, to homes of clients after they leave the meal program, a wide variety of things. Um, last year was, of course, an aberration because of COVID and, and, and virtual programming. But in 2019, I think we provided 99 community nutrition education classes uh, through partnerships with two community health centers. And also we've done a lot of work with our libraries in two counties. Um, and libraries are a really awesome place to reach low-income community members. And we've done a lot of classes for children, both five to nine-year-olds and um, five to uh, five to nine-year-olds and 10 to 12-year-olds. Um, and then you actually get the whole family, which is really great. This photo is a picture of a program that we developed and tested called Smartbox. Um, it was for uh, community members, primarily Latinx, who were had either um, uncontrolled hypertension or uncontrolled diabetes. We ran the program at an elementary school in a predominantly Hispanic neighborhood. It was um, every Saturday morning and we had, uh, it was taught in Spanish with simultaneous translation. We had childcare and we invited people to bring their whole families. Um, and we had really, really, and, and they, along with the classes, they went home every week with a small number of prepared meals plus groceries and recipes. And um, we saw really significant results from this program and have been kind of adapting it um, and ever since and, and, and like to do more with it. But nutrition education, really important piece and the layering of food as medicine interventions with education is, is a really critical thing um, for us to think about. Next slide. As I mentioned, we over the years, starting back in 2010, um, have trained um, about a dozen communities around the US and now also in Denmark to essentially replicate the model, which I've just shared with you. 
and um, they sign an affiliate licensing agreement. We do a very in-depth four-day training here in our headquarters location. Um, we have an ops manual, which is um, digital as well as printed and um, an integrated database system. And then we provide ongoing technical support and really kind of backbone the learning community of these affiliates with, um, I do a monthly call with our EDs, and then we also do a monthly call that rotates between our different program areas and an annual um, two-day summit where we get together and share ideas. Um, so some of you may be near some of these, um, these locations, and we're always interested in talking with people about bringing um, our model to their community. So let me know if you're interested in that. Okay, next slide. So now I'm gonna switch gears and talk a little bit about um, food as medicine and why it matters. Um, so these are just some of the big picture stats that I always share. And every time I look at them, I continue to be kind of struck by, by them. So 50 million Americans are food insecure in the US. And food insecurity is costing almost $77 billion a year in direct healthcare costs. That doesn't include lost productivity. Um, and we're going to see a slide a little bit later that talks about some of the data around food insecurity and health. Um, next slide. So this is a really a disgusting picture, but diet-related illness is now the leading cause of mortality in the U.S. And that is huge to take in, right? That, that basically means that the leading cause of immortality in the United States is actually preventable. Um, next slide. And 85% of our healthcare spending goes to chronic disease. So again, we are spending tremendous amounts of resources on illnesses and healthcare costs that are basically preventable by changing diets. And then last slide on this, this one. Three out of four young people don't qualify for military service. That is just astonishing to think about. And there's some work um, that Tufts is leading around um, elevating and coordinating nutrition research um, and, and really calling out that this is a national security problem. And just by the way, um, if you put stuff in chat, Riley, who's our, program, our, our policy coordinator at Ceres, um, is tracking that. And she, um, she can answer some of those questions. And then we'll have time for Q of A. Q&A a little bit later. So next slide. So the good news is that healthcare organizations and policymakers are really starting to grapple with the implication of all of that data. And much of the thinking is being informed by this idea called social determinants of health. And especially by the realization that only 20% of our health is related to healthcare itself and what takes place in the doctor's office. So the good or bad news, depending on how you think about it, is that 30% of our health is actually related to the choices we make every day. So that's things like diet and exercise, tobacco use, alcohol use, sexual activity, um, the things, you know, getting enough sleep, uh, stress management, the things that you and I, the choices that you and I make every day in our lives. The thing that we have to wrestle with is that 40% of our health is actually related to things that drive our ability to make those choices. So if you're like one of our clients and you're living on $16,000 a year and you live in a neighborhood that's not safe to go outside, your ability to make good choices about diet and exercise is not the same as mine. Um, you may have more stress, you may then drink more alcohol, you may smoke. There's a whole host of things that drive from that. And so the realization that's really happened is that the healthcare sector and particularly health plans that pay, our, pay for our healthcare are realizing that they're not gonna improve outcomes or get a handle on healthcare costs without starting to think about social determinants of health. And so there's really this revolution that's happening. Um, and I'll just tell a story from the Root Cause Coalition a couple of years ago that really struck me. And this is um, Humana, which is a, a large health plan in Southeast part of the country. And they started to see that their emergency department visits among their Medicaid population were way up in the last week of the month. And what happens in the last week of the month is people run out of their food benefits. And if you're on diabetes medication and you start skipping meals, you can become hypoglycemic and then you end up in the emergency department. And so they started to connect the dots between those two things and are now testing a lot of interventions around food insecurity 
and covering that last week of the month um, as a strategy instead of paying for that ED visit. So it's just one of many, many, many examples that are happening right now. So next slide. So this is a version of um, what we call the food is medicine pyramid, and there's a lot of them um, running around. But basically, if you see on the left, we're looking at prevention to treatment. And really what this is saying is we have to think about everything. So this pyramid starts at the bottom with the simple statement, healthy food for all. So this is where we're thinking about things like investments in WIC, in investments in SNAP, the, the um, food, what used to be called food stamps, um, healthy school lunches, increasing investments in senior meals, like all of the ways that we as a community and I mean community in the big sense of the word, a collective community, fund food investments, right? We have to make sure that everybody has access to enough healthy food in order to live a, you know, a, full, a full and productive life. Then as you start moving up, you think about things, what are the interventions that we need for people who are at the risk of acute or chronic illness? So this is where we see things like produce prescriptions, which there's now a lot of work being done. Um, USDA has upped the investments they're making in produce prescription pilots. Rockefeller Foundation is taking on a big project to um, evaluate the data around produce prescriptions and look at a strategy for scaling produce prescriptions. So produce prescriptions are basically saying if you have someone who's food insecure, maybe they're at risk of hypertension, they're right on the cusp, or they're pre-diabetic, or there's a family where children are um, overweight or pre-diabetic, how do we make sure that they have the money they need to get enough fruits and vegetables to help improve the health situation? And then kind of moving up next, things like medically tailored groceries, or um, there was a, some work done a few years ago where a number of um, food, uh, food banks around the country tested a diabetes wellness box. So patients who had diabetes, instead of getting the normal box, which often included foods that weren't appropriate for diabetes, there was a tailored box of groceries um, for people with diabetes. That's a really simple solution. That box definitely costs more than a standard um, uh, emergency food bank box of meals. But um, if we can, again, get people the right food at the right time, we're gonna prevent people moving up to the top of this pyramid where we're really talking about people with serious illness or disability. So medically tailored meals are a particular intervention. Meals are tailored, um, and it's often for people who are too sick to shop or cook for themselves. Um, and we need all of this. And you know, that's the thing I think we need to realize is that um, we need the full, full pyramid um, if we're gonna get the job done. Next slide. So this is just a little bit of the data on um, just the question of food insecurity and, um, and health. So not looking at medically tailored meals, but just providing enough food. And as you'll see, there's really, really broad uh, supportive data, um, reductions in um, hemoglobin A1C, which is the blood pressure, uh, blood sugar measure, reductions in blood pressure and BMI, preterm birth. So this is one that we're starting to get involved with. There's a couple of good preliminary studies looking at veggie vouchers um, for low-income moms, showing a really, really good reduction in preterm birth and increase in birth weight, which are, which are the two drivers of healthy birth outcomes. Um, and I'll just say one thing about this intervention is that for healthcare right now, and I'll talk about this more in a minute, but, but what health plans want is to be able to get a return on their investment, right? They wanna know that if they spend for food as medicine interventions, they're gonna get, um, they're gonna, they're gonna at least be cost neutral, if not cost savings. And that is one of the things that's preventing a lot of the investments more upstream because it's harder, you know, if you invest in um, making sure that a child that's um, overweight and leading towards diabetes, if you invest to prevent that progression, you don't see the cost savings of that for quite a while. What's exciting about the, the investments in um, pregnancy is that if you can reduce um, if you can reduce birth complications, you get that ROI. But you're making an investment in the in the health and well-being of that child and family um, for the life um, of of that um, of that family, which is really awesome. There's also a lot of links now to depression and a lot more work being done around. Um, 
patients with a mild to moderate depression, the social connection piece, but also there, there is some data starting to come forward around nutritional benefits. And then medication adherence and heart failure symptom control. So just, you know, this is, this is just a small summary and the next slide we'll look at um, medically tailored meals. So th this is a summary of uh, the peer reviewed data around medically tailored meals. Um, there's another 15 studies in progress. I'll talk about a couple that we've been involved with in a minute, but overall anywhere from a 16 to 24% net savings for healthcare funders um, after the cost of the intervention, significant reductions in hospitalizations. A lot of this work is looking at um, when people are discharged from the hospital and making sure that they have the support they need to be healthy at home and not bouncing back in. Those hospitalizations are expensive and uh, Medicare does not reimburse for unplanned readmissions within 30 days. And so there's a real incentive to address that. Much more likely to be discharged to home, uh, medication adherence going up, um, reductions in ED visits, a reduction in admission to skilled nursing facilities, and a decrease in days where mental health interferes with quality of life. And you know, one of the things that um, that has really become more of a concern among plans over the last year because of COVID is the um, impact of isolation um, on uh, people's willingness to engage in their healthcare and and just their overall quality of life. So those are really important. Next slide. So as I mentioned, there is a lot of momentum around food as medicine, and I'm, I'm just going to highlight some areas that are going on. Um, the Aspen Institute um, Food and Society Program is in a year, 18-month program right now to develop a national research action plan for food as medicine, um, and that will come out, I think, in October. Um, I'm an advisor to that effort. Um, Tufts has also come out with a white paper around the critical importance of aligning uh, federal nutrition research efforts. And um, I can share that with anyone that's interested in it, but essentially we do nutrition research in, I don't know, something like two dozen different agencies and it's not coordinated, it's not being elevated and it's not being used to really drive um, investments in, in food as medicine and align the investments that we're already making through US Department of Agriculture in a way that can improve outcomes. Um, Center for Medicaid Services, one of the exciting and little known benefits of the Affordable Care Act was that the Affordable Air Care Act created a system for state Medicaid plans to really innovate what they were doing. Um, so every five years, states can apply to CMS to create innovations within their Medicaid systems. And there's lots of work being done around the country um, California for the last five years has been testing what are called whole person care models and home, health home models, where there are these wraparound services. A lot of it is focused on people who are at risk of homelessness or, or homeless. Um, so this is the mechanism that California is using right now, which, which um, I'll talk about. North Carolina is also doing a lot of work within their Medicare system. They have a waiver where they're testing a lot of food as medicine interventions. There's also work being done in, in New York and Massachusetts. And then produce prescriptions, huge. Um, the work that started with Wholesome Wave and, and others um, that led to the um, investment under USDA. So the, the grant program is now called GUSNIP, which is the Gus Schumacher Nutrition Incentive Program, where there are significant dollars on an annual basis for um, community organizations to partner with, with community health centers and health providers to test produce prescription interventions. And that's where we're now des, uh, designing a pilot that will start this year and, and submitting to GUSNIP to do a, a, a pilot around pregnancy. Um, but there's pilots being done again around uncontrolled hypertension, uncontrolled diabetes, um, overweight children, um, lots of lots of different things that are that are being tested. And then in Medicare, so right now all of the innovations that are happening in Medicaid are essentially happening at the state level. Um, at the federal level, Medicaid, Medicaid is relatively resistant to integrating food interventions um, because for them, they're still thinking that that's about food insecurity and we're a healthcare program, but, um, but that is starting to shift. And CMS actually put out guidance a couple of months ago on how states can use existing Medicaid structures 
to address social determinants of health. Um, there was nothing really new in it, but but they're but they're working on it. But Medicare, there have been some changes. So um, for those of you not steeped in this work, Medicare is the pro so Medicaid is the program for poverty, uh, for low-income people, and Medicare is the program for people over 65. Within Medicare, there's two programs. There's Medicare Advantage, which is about a third of Medicare members, and those are plans that you invest in um, beyond your basic Medicare coverage. And then there's what we call fee-for-service Medicare, which is the straight program. Um, so Medicare Advantage, um, there, were, there were changes made that went into effect in 2020, where Medicare Advantage plans can now offer to cover meals and medically tailored meals for a, a range of populations. Um, uh, and they, they, they don't have to, but they can. And in 2020, there was not a lot of uptake um, for these benefits. But there's starting to be some peer pressure around, around among plans, and there's a much greater uptake this year, um, and we think that that will continue. And plans are starting where they always do, which is where they can get the most bang for their buck, and that's understandable. And hopefully, we'll see it roll out. Um, unfortunately, there's an equity issue because two thirds of Medicare members are are not in Medicare Advantage plans, and so along with our colleagues um, and uh, Congressman McGovern in Massachusetts. Uh, he introduced with bipartisan support last year a bill to fund a 10 state pilot um, of medically tailored meals in the Medicare fee for service system. And that's been held up by, you know, all the shenanigans in Washington. Um, but we're hoping that that will move forward in the next year or so. And, and just, I, I would say, you know, these are areas of kind of momentum. But the other thing I would just say is that nearly every major health plan in the country is doing something in the food and medicine space. So it may vary and people are at different stages and some people are funding this work through grants to community-based organizations, some are piloting things, some have actually instituted benefits. They're a little bit all over the map, but there's um, a lot, a lot happening. Um, and uh, that's very encouraging. So next slide. So, you know, here's kind of the, the, the state of the field um, from my perspective is that if we're going to drive change, and I want to back up a minute. The reason we're really focused on Medicaid and Medicare is that those are the largest health insurance programs in the country. Um, we, I believe that um, while it is really important that we drive for increased investments in things like WIC and SNAP benefits and school lunch and senior meals, that the willingness in Washington to increase what are considered entitlement programs is not very high. And so if we are going to really drive significant change in terms of access to healthy food for the populations that need it most, the opportunity that exists is by making changes in Medicare and Medicaid. Um, you know, for the cost of a day in the hospital can fund somebody's food for a year. So the trade-off within the healthcare space is really great. And um, if we can really demonstrate the cost benefit analysis for health payers, they are gonna be motivated to integrate these benefits. And we can then really free up a lot of dollars to improve access to healthy food. So that's really the, the rationale here. Um, and that, um, you know, low-income people and seniors are carrying the brunt of health disparity. So uh, there's really good reason to focus here. So what we need are research studies that really demonstrate the health benefits of different kinds of interventions for different kinds of populations. We need to be able to demonstrate that there are not only patient satisfaction, improved patient outcomes, but cost savings. And then there's a big piece of work, which we're engaged with now in California around educating health providers and health plans and legislators about how and why to adopt these benefits. And then we can start driving policy change. Next slide. So our work around this started in, um, in 2016. So a series is part of a national coalition called the Food is Medicine Coalition. And um, 
We are made up of about two dozen agencies, many of whom started during the AIDS HIV epidemic, but been doing this work for 30 to 35 years. And we meet every, um, every September um, for a three-day symposium, uh, along with many other times during the year, but we, we generally meet in person in DC. And I came home from the meeting in 2016, really fired up about this food health connection piece. And um, three or four days later, we had our annual fundraising event and um, our state senator, a, a guy named Mike McGuire was our MC for that event. And so I had this brief conversation with him saying, hey, I wanna sit down with you and talk about food as medicine and how our work is really a healthcare intervention. And so we said, great, let's set that up. I sat down with him in November of that year. And my, my goal at that point was really to get him to just shift his thinking from, you know, where I thought he was, which, you know, that really sweet program where the teens cook meals for cancer patients to understanding the power of our work in this kind of healthcare space. And he's a smart guy. He, was, he had just been elected um, when he and I met and he was in his first year, I think. And he got really excited and said, um, so, you know, one of his questions was, what, what do you need? And at that point, I had been trying really hard to get Kaiser Permanente to do some research with me. And I had been showing them studies from our colleague organizations around the country. And often they would, they would say like, well, that's really nice that that happened in Philadelphia, but why do I think that would, you know, how do I know that would, you know, happen here? And so what I said to him was, we need larger research studies. We need, we need multiple agency, um, multiple county, multiple state research studies. And so I came back, we met again in January of 2017. And he said, I, I want, I think we should ask the Senate, the California Senate for $9 million to do a statewide study. And his first question was, do you have colleagues in Southern California? So here's a little, uh, you know, driving legislative change conversation. Um, California is a big state, as you can see. And if you're going to get something adopted by the California legislature, you can't just have representatives from a couple of small counties who are interested. You've got to have legislators from across the spectrum. And our coalition includes six different counties, actually seven different counties, including Los Angeles County and San Diego County and San Francisco and Santa Clara. And Los Angeles, of course, is a huge county, has many, many, many legislators, and, um, and so does San Diego. And so we were able to put a coalition together and to really build legislative support, both in the assembly and in the Senate. We didn't start the work until the end of February. Um, we were first told like, there's no chance in hell you're gonna get this through. And lo and behold, we went to work and we built enough legislative support to get this pilot funded. We were funded in 2017. We had a contract with the state in place um, by early 2018 and we launched the pilot. So. We, what we're doing is a multi-year statewide study in seven counties. There are six medically tailored meal providers who are engaged and we are providing a um, 21 meal a week, three month intervention to Medi-Cal patients with congestive heart failure. And um, congestive heart failure has the highest readmission rate of, of any diagnoses in California and, and for most health plans. Um, and so it's a chance to really demonstrate that we can move the needle on that. We will have data um, next year. We're completing the study this year. We'll have data next year, but the state has already moved forward um, uh, thanks to this, um, this work to include um, medically tailored meals as a covered benefit starting in 2022. So next slide. I'm just gonna mention a few other um, pilots that we've done. I already talked about Smartbox. Um, we, we did that um, through a cardiovascular disease collaborative that we're part of, and we were looking at addressing risk factors to cardiovascular disease, which is um, hypertension and diabetes. Both are very nutritionally related. Um, we were able to dramatically improve healthy food choices in this population, uh, significantly decrease food insecurity, and improve both attitudes and confidence in healthy eating. Um, and we were really, really loved this model, which included the whole family, a combination of education, meals, and groceries in a cohort-based model where people were really learning together. And I'm happy if anyone's interested in, you know, seeing exactly what we did, I'm really happy to share. We have tried unsuccessfully to get 
funding to expand this pilot, but we're, we're using the ideas from it and other things that we're doing. Next slide. So um, we have a long relationship with Kaiser Permanente. For those of you who are not in Kaiser regions, they're a national health plan. And more importantly, they're what's called a closed system. So they're a health provider and a plan. So they have really, really good data on their members. And uh, because of that, they have driven a lot of innovation. They're very, very forward thinking about a lot of these issues. And um, I have several board members from Kaiser in my organization and have been in conversation with them for quite a while. We did a small pilot with them in Santa Rosa a couple of years ago, um, but we were able to have some conversations with Kaiser at a national level, their national community benefits lead. They're doing a lot of work around food insecurity um, and developing what they're calling their national food for life strategy. And so in those conversations, um, we started to talk with them about how Kaiser could be leading nationally around medically tailored meals. And um, there's a lot of unanswered questions about, about how to apply medically tailored meals as an intervention, the way that healthcare thinks about intervention. So how many meals, for how long, do you include the family members? Um, in what situations, for what diagnoses? And so uh, we started a conversation with Kaiser a while ago and Lo and behold, they made a decision in um, late 2019 to put $5 million into um, four large scale randomized controlled trials for medically tailored meals. And this is really, really critical work. They're a very well respected healthcare partner. They did, they, so they're, they're just wrapping up studies in um, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, and in the Bay Area. And Ceres partnered with um, Project Open Hand, our colleagues in San Francisco, and we designed a study which basically looks at the value of medically tailored meals at discharge for four different diagnoses. Um, we're providing seven meals a week for 10 weeks, and we're doing it for everyone in the family, which is um, not where most health plans are thinking. But again, we think it's critically important, especially for low-income families. If you don't provide meals for everyone, those meals are going to be shared and you're going to dilute the value of the intervention. But more importantly, if you're going to draw, if you're trying to drive dietary change, again, you're not going to bring the whole family along. And we're so we're testing against Kaiser's usual standard of care, which is you know barely any even nutrition education, meals for everyone in the family versus meals for everyone in the family plus um, support from a registered dietitian around nutrition education. And those studies are just wrapping, and Kaiser will be coming out around June with the data and they're planning to really present widely and do peer reviewed studies and so forth. And that will be a, a really significant, I think, contribution to the field. Um, and they will be incorporating into their own business model, but also really trying to drive change. Next slide. Um, so partnership FQHCs are federally qualified health centers. Those are community health centers um, that, that work primarily with the Medicaid population. We are in the process of launching three different pilots with um, local community health centers with the aim of testing some interventions and being able to show data to our local Medicaid plan uh, to help drive adoption of these benefits. One pilot that we're doing is with people who have uncontrolled hypertension and diabetes. Um, those are people who are working with a community health worker um, for support and education, and we're layering meals on top of that. Um, we're also doing the pregnancy pilot, which I talked about, which um, basically is four weeks of meals when they enter the OBGYN practice, so somewhere around probably eight or 10 weeks. That provides some basic education about what does a healthy plate look like, um, gets people to try food that they might not have tried otherwise. Then from week five to birth, we'll be providing a weekly, well, it'll be a monthly, a monthly set of veggie vouchers to be redeemed at 16 different farmers markets in Sonoma County. And then postpartum, um, another four weeks of meals when support is really needed. And we'll be looking at birth weight, preterm birth, um, and uh, postpartum depression um, as three different measures. And our last pilot that we're doing right now is seniors with seniors who are food insecure, have mild to moderate depression and at least one chronic health condition. And we're gonna see how we can move the needle with that population. Last slide here. Um, finally, I, I mentioned uh, GUSNIP. So we are applying to GUSNIP for the pregnancy pilot um, and, uh, and we're doing some work around that right now. 
Next slide. So I'm going to um, wrap with these ideas. So in the conversations, I work with a lot of different players in the field and with a lot of um, colleagues, you know, emergency food provider colleagues. I work with a lot of health plans and medical providers. And these are ideas that I run up against that I think we really have to be able to challenge. So the first one is just the disconnect, be the disconnect between food and health. So starting at the federal level. So all of the food investments that we make as a federal government happen in the US Department of Agriculture's budget. And they're considered um, somehow related to the success of farms um, or about food insecurity. They are not connected in any fundamental way to the investments we make in health and human services. And that disconnect continues at every state level and every county level. So until we start to connect the dots between the underinvestment we make in food and the cost of our healthcare and the cost of chronic disease, we're not gonna solve this problem. And, and food as medicine research is starting to do that, right? When, when we do medically tailored meal research and we can say, when this person has the right food, this is what happens versus when they don't have the right food, this is what, this, this is what happens. We're starting to make that connection, but we have to start in all of our, these, these are interconnected conversations. Then the idea that investing in the safety net is a problem. So this conversation has been around entitlements, just the way we call it, we call them entitlements. Entitlements are bad. We think of entitlements, many people do as something some of us are funding through our tax dollars for some people who, you know, for whatever reason are not, not able to take care of themselves. The reality is that we radically underinvest invest in the safety net in this country, and that's a problem because we're paying for it in many other places. We're paying for it in unemployment benefits, in the juvenile justice system, within in our healthcare spending, all of these different places. I personally, I like one of my silver linings from COVID is that we collectively start to think about the safety net in a different way. Because the reality is that investing in the safety net is not only morally the right thing to do, but it's financially the right thing to do. Investing in the safety net is how we invest in our collective future, in the health and well being, the civic engagement, the functioning of our society 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years down the road. It's, it's how we make sure that the next generation of young people are healthy, engaged, able to have great jobs, all of those things. It starts with investing in the safety net. The third one is food should be cheap. And um, you know, this, is, this is a conversation that's been driven over the last um, you know, 30, 40, 50 years as we've gotten all of this you know, cheap you know, food that's overly flavored. Um, but I am running into it even among our healthcare partners. So um, this, is one, this is one where I think true cost accounting is really gonna be helpful. But we also have to start really talking about that food is not, all food is not the same. Um, that, you know, I'll just say there's a national meal provider um, that can drop ship 14 meals anywhere in the country. And those meals are really, really cheap. And all, lots of healthcare providers want to contract with that meal provider for their meals because they can check the box and say they're offering that benefit. Um, but though the food in those meals is terrible. Uh, the food sourcing is generating more pesticide use and farm worker health, all, all of that. It is, there is such an incredibly deep disconnect around this question. And I have been directly challenging the healthcare organizations that we work around this issue, that if you want high quality food that helps to build community health and resilience, which to say all hospitals and health centers say they wanna do and health plans say they wanna do, you have to look at the kind of food you're investing in and you have to be willing to pay for that kind of food. We had one success recently where Kaiser was willing to pay us a premium in the randomized control trial we did because we were doing 100% organic. But this one we have to challenge over and over and over again. And then the last one is our goal should be to end hunger. And you, you, you all need to be saying like, why? That, that's right. Um, that's not enough. That's not enough. 
the question is not hunger. The question is nutrition security. We have to change our thinking. Um, we continue to drive chronic disease by providing really crappy food to people in the name of ending hunger. And we have to challenge that idea and really start elevating, um, again, high quality food and think about nutrition security, not just food security and not just ending hunger. So I, um, I'm gonna wrap there, next slide. And I would love, oh, sorry, one more. Um, so this is the way that we think about our work at Ceres and, um, and the way we, we're trying to work with our colleagues to think about this work. So we intersect. Um, so our work is around medically tailored meals, food insecurity, um, food as medicine. And for the organizations I work with in that space, they're thinking about chronic disease, food and nutrition insecurity, maybe social disconnection and maybe health disparities. And then we also work with the organic sector, regenerative ag, all of you. For that group, we're talking about unhealthy and unsustainable food systems, climate disruption, impact on farm and food system workers, all of those other things that have to do about the food system. This graph is really saying our healthcare system, our food system, our environment, it's one interconnected system. And we have to be thinking about all of it in the way that we approach the interventions we're designing, the coalitions we're building, the way that we're doing this work. And I, I, I'll say again, you know, I was really excited by the work that Rockefeller did last year in the Reset the Table report. And then um, that coalition of organizations that worked with Rockefeller provided guidance to the Biden-Harris transition team and really, really talked about the fact that these solutions can't be disconnected from each other. They can't be siloed. They have to be seen in an interconnected way. Um, and we have to continue to drive that conversation as well. Next slide. So support for organics. Um, you know, we, in both the work that we're doing, well, especially with uh, nutrition providers, emergency food banks, our colleagues, we continually drive a conversation about food quality. Um, we are Eat Real certified um, as a meal provider. I think the only one in the country. We do a lot of work with healthcare without harm. If you haven't looked at, they have this amazing uh, white paper that lays out what they call the environmental nutrition framework, um, which we love. We work with CCOF. We're members of the California Food and Farming Network. Um, back in 2016, we did our own white paper called The Power of Our Food Choices that looked at the research around um, organic, sustainable, food versus conventionally farmed. Um, there's a lot of good data in there. And then we work closely with CCOF around their benefits report, which really you know, is an updated version of that, looking at all of the research um, around how our investments in organic and regenerative agriculture can drive a whole host of benefits across communities. Um, and they are now really working to, on a policy agenda, to increase organic agriculture in California from, I think, 10 to 30 percent. Um, I may not have those numbers right. Um, so we support all of that work. Next slide. So here we are at questions. So I am happy to answer questions about any of this and um, really, really interested in the work all of you are doing um, in your communities and in your coalitions and how it intersects with, with these ideas. So back to you, Dan, for some Q&A. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, a wonderful outline of what you've done and what you're doing. I'm most curious about what you see coming forth. What are you intending and what are the pieces you see? There's a number I mean, of them, I'm sure you can do. Yeah, I mean, our, our current goal is um, really focused on California because we have built this infrastructure of organizations and also a pretty broad awareness now across many leading health plans um, and the California legislature and Department of Healthcare Services about the value of integrating food into Medicaid. And so our current goal is to develop the capacity for, for coverage of medically tailored meals to anyone in California, all 58 counties, um, and to drive adoption of the benefit of the new benefit that's coming um, next year in California. 
among plans across the street, basically to say, how do we make California a model and really, really drive full adoption and then be able to showcase the, the value of that for other states and, and eventually for the federal government. And then I would say kind of corollary to that is this question around at the same time driving conversations about food quality. Um, and again, California is well positioned to do that. So within our California Food is Medicine Coalition, we are doing some work around developing a sustainability pledge for our organizations and doing the education among our members about why um, their sourcing is important and, and starting to hold that up as well. Um, and then we do, we do a lot of work, as I said, with California Food and Farming Network. There's a, um, a bunch of work being done to develop a, a, a resiliency bond um, that would go on the ballot next year in California that would fund a, a wide range of things around um, local food infrastructure and organics and um, food as medicine infrastructure. So supporting things like that. And, and again, um, my, I had a, you know, my aha a couple of years ago was there's th this momentum is happening around integration of food because the plans have to do it. There's just, they're not going to get where they need to get without it. If that continues disconnected from the conversation about food quality and about resilient, sustainable food systems, we're going to miss a tremendous opportunity and we're going to drive, you know, while we're driving some positive change, we're not nearly driving the positive change that we could. So Ceres has really taken on kind of being pretty outspoken and challenging in a lot of the coalitions and conversations we're in, in the food as medicine space around the food quality conversation. Brilliant, thank you. <laughs> You're uh, got a good voice. Um, I'm just looking at the Q&A, the question from Mandy, um, how do you navigate debates around what is healthy? You see that question? Um, so <laughs> that's always a hard one. You know, there's, so there is the, you know, there's the traditional understanding among registered dietitians um, around how we define, you know, a healthy plate and all that. And our national coalition and our statewide coalition has a clinical committee driven by our registered dietitian community. And so at the, like the basic level, right, you, you want to make sure that someone has the nutrients that they need related to their illness. So with diabetes, that's carb management, with congestive heart failure, sodium and saturated fat. You know, there's like some basic things um, that as a medically tailored meal provider, we have, to, we have to deal with. Then there's the next level up, which you know, for me, I'm just talking off the top of my head is, because um, I've never answered this question exactly this way, is things like, you know, we do 100% whole grain, we do no, no processed sugar in our meals. Um, you know, there's that next level. Then the, the next level up is, you know, is that food sustainably produced? What kind of soil was that food grown in? Um, what's, the, what's the transit time? You know, how fresh is it? Uh, you know, antibiotics and hormones, uh, what, what kind of grass did it eat? I mean, there's that next level up, right? And so, but the reality is, and going back to the population that, they, that we work with, for the vast majority of Americans, really what is gonna drive health improvement for them is reducing their consumption of processed sugar and processed foods and eating more fruits and vegetables. And really, that, that is really the bottom line. And I think all of us who are you know, in the movements that we're in and thinking about the level of things that we're thinking about, we have to remember that. That is true. And everything else is like really gravy on top of that for the vast majority of people. And for them, it's really not more complicated than that. We have to start there. Um, and that's why GUSNIP is really important, but we can't not have the other conversations because the other conversation is not about the health of people. It's about the health of the system that supports all of us. And this was a big aha that actually some of my staff even had a couple of years ago when we did a presentation with CCOF at the Root Cause Coalition. And I said, we have to remember that for one of Siri's patients, the fact that they're eating organic food is really not the thing that's gonna drive health improvement for them. It's the kinds of food that we're shifting their diets to. 
But that organic choice for us to purchase organic food is about the broader, the health of the broader system, which will eventually drive illness, which will eventually mean we can't grow enough food and there's going to be more hunger. So we have to disconnect the, the personal benefit immediately from the system benefit that has the longer term impact. And we have to talk about both of them, right? We can't just talk about one of those. I think that's what I've always appreciated about your work is it's very pragmatic about where are the real, you know, cutting edge for most people. It's not quality issue, even though we may be seeing that as a broader objective. So. And again, it's not like I completely, we just, we just did a, a policy nourishing discourse article on soil. I mean, like we talk about soil health in series. It's not like I believe that, but I also want to work at this level of how do we drive the highest and best change for everyone, um, <clears throat> and we have to we have to connect down to where where people are. Um, so it's 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 yes and right. It's 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 all of it that has to happen. Yeah, um, I've got a quick question from Greg. Um, people interested in suppressing this work. I'm not sure if you want to touch on that or not. Say that, say that again. Do you think anyone would be trying to suppress the food as medicine movement because they would benefit from people being chronically sick? I mean, there's, there's lots of people trying to control parts of this conversation. I mean, you know, we, we all know that um, that big ag has, has for years controlled how the USDA defines, you know, the healthy food pyramid um, and what, despite the research, what has been considered healthy and not healthy under USDA has been every, every single cycle is shaped by, by the food industry. Um, yeah. You know, what gets subsidies, what doesn't get subsidies. All of those things are really critically important to building a healthy, resilient and just food system where everyone has, can, can have access to the healthy food they need. But from the standpoint of someone being interested in kind of suppressing the work around gusnip or medically tailored meals. I don't see it happening there. It's more because there the the everyone involved has something to gain. The plans, the health providers, the federal That's government, it. like the governments all have something to gain if that can be successful. Um, Cause we've just designed, you know, we've showcased the win-win. But when you think about like more foundational food policy, um, you know, all the work that, you know, that's now being done, the new head of the Ag Committee in the House is an African American from Georgia, who's, you know, really talking about black farmers and how black farmers have lost over the last 50 years, primarily because of USDA. So it's more at that foundational level, I think, where there's, um, there's definitely stakeholders that want to control things. And I'll, I'll even say in California, I mean, um, California, um, uh, the, the Farm Bureau, the California Farm Bureau is constantly pushing back again about any place where we, we put the word organic in. Um, so, you know, th that's where you see it, but not around yeah. food as medicine at the level that we're working on driving change right now. In large part because the implications aren't understood? Um, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not deep in. That would be a good question for CCOF. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, they 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 want to somehow protect their members, and um, they're not they're not seeing where it's going already. You know, and and what the win wins are. Yeah. All right. Uh, question from Bryn about the uh, safety net. The way we think about it, it's a you know I think it's a teach them to fish sort of concept. Question. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, of data. Um, you know, we were looking, for example, at some of the data around Calp. So children who receive SNAP benefits are more likely to graduate from high school. High school graduation leads to significantly higher lifetime earnings, probably better quality job, less likely to be on unemployment. So it's like, would we rather pay for more CalFresh benefits or would we rather subsidize that person later in life because they don't have the skills and the ability to support themselves. Same thing with, you know, juvenile justice system. Like, 
you know, we can invest in young people and give them the skills that they need to be successful, or we can, you know, pay to keep them in juvenile justice. You know, there's many, many, many examples of this, and I'm sure, you know, many of you on on the on the call um, have your own examples. But you know, it's, and the, and the basic thing with with food is we either invest in people having enough healthy food to develop in a healthy way and to prevent the onset of chronic illnesses or we're going to pay for them in the Medicaid system. And so it, it, this idea that somehow the safety net is something that we pay for, we, we, I think the thing is we think of it as something that we pay for that has no benefits. Mm -hmm. We're not connecting the dots between the short-term investment and the long-term benefit and understanding that we build a healthy community by making sure that all of us have the resources we need to be successful in life. And that that collective investment is not only, like I said, morally the right thing to do, but that it's a financially smart thing to do. That it's actually a better investment to invest there than to pay for all the consequences later of that underinvestment. So then the question from ABT is, why are products like soda, chips, candy, um, Cereals, breads. Why aren't they taxed? Why are they snap and wick benefits? Exactly. And how do we change? Exactly. And right. you can't you can't use wick benefits for organic milk. So this is what I mean. Like at that level of this is where the the connecting the dots between these things has to filter down. These systems are entrenched in the way that they think about it. And so this is where the work is going back digging in, starting to show the research, starting to drive change. And this is where the industry, right? I mean, think about, you know, a lot of crap that goes into WIC or that goes to food banks is crappy food that the industry can't sell. Yeah. And yes. so we dump it on the people that can least afford to eat it, right? Yeah. So that has got to change. You know, one of, one of my lines is, you know, the best, the, the highest and best use for some food is to be composted. <laughs> Just because it's out there doesn't mean someone should eat it. We have to really challenge that notion. Food banks are moving in this direction. Like our yeah. food bank doesn't take any soda, doesn't take any candy. I mean, you know, there's changes happening, but these are entrenched systems that came out that have their, you know, they're just entrenched and they have to be taken apart and it, it takes time. All right, I'm just looking at other questions from PR. Why would a doctor be motivated to learn and teach health benefits when they would get less money because they'd be less busy? In Europe, they're paid when their patients don't come in. Yeah, so up? there is, um, th it's a great question because the whole other side of this equation is we have to totally reorganize the way we pay for healthcare, right? Um, right now, and this is also one of the um, benefits of the ACA that very few people really understand. So the ACA is actually driving change to what's called a value-based healthcare system. So rather than fee for service, you're paid for the, for the quality of outcomes among your patients. And whole person care was a model for that. Um, in California, we're moving to what's called enhanced care management, where highest utilizer patients will be in this kind of wraparound care and the plans will get reimbursed but because they have done a good job and that the profit sharing, part of the profit sharing comes back to the plans. So the whole system is not, the, this, the healthcare system is not incentivized in the right way is really the bottom line. And there is work being done to change that. But one of the challenges is that um, the work around social determinants of health broadly and around food more specifically, doesn't line up with the current incentives in most places. So um, there's a lot of work being done around this and it is happening already within the ACA through a whole set of innovation projects around what's called value-based payment models. Um, but that has to change. And you know, here's the other thing that is just really, really practical. You know, In California, we got $6 million to do a large scale pilot for congestive heart failure, and we struggle to get enough referrals. The reason is because those referrals have to come from a healthcare provider, 
and within the structure, the existing structure of healthcare, it is nobody's job to look at population health data, identify patients who could benefit from an intervention and refer to it when there's no incentive back to the organization. You know, this is where patient navigators, community health workers are starting to be deployed to do this kind of work. But, you know, how does the, how does the medical provider in their 20 minute visit, um, you know, address this kind of stuff? They just don't have the time. Other questions? Yeah, sorry, I was looking at the other questions and I was <laughs> blocked out. Um, <clears throat> I lobby for the medical community and find that those at the highest level of medical training find it almost impossible to find the time to counsel patients and diet and are looking for improving integration of programs like this. Can you offer any suggestions on how to integrate program, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> this is the big challenge and there's, there's other work that's um, underway to change the medical licensing requirements so that, that doctors have to have more nutrition education in order to, to become licensed. Um, most, so, Medical nutrition therapy, so basically nutrition education and nutrition counseling is already covered um, by most, by, by Medicaid and Medicare. So um, having a registered dietitian within a medical clinic that can bill for, for MNT, medical nutrition therapy, is one way to get around this, to not have it be something that the provider necessarily takes on, but to structure the, the practice or the health clinic to have the right licensed individuals to be able to provide that service um, to, to clients is one way. Health coaching can also be covered. Um, so really working with, with your plan, your state around how do you use the existing benefit structures to do that is one way to get around that. Have you and the other, I'll just say one other thing. Um, yeah. We have been um, contracted with, with two health centers one for like eight or nine years now, where we do every other week nutrition education visits and they're billed as what's called a shared group medical visit. That means if a provider is there at the beginning, they weigh people and take their blood pressure and then they come into the class, that, that um, all of the people in that class can be billed to Medicaid under a shared group medical visit model. And that's how the health clinic that we work with actually contract with us to provide nutrition education and they, they make money on that. So these yeah. are some of the ways you can kind of get around some of these things in the current current structures. Just playing the, playing the system. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, have you contacted USDA secretary or her secretary? Is Tom Vilsack educatable? Um, I, I don't, we work with our um, California Department of Food and Agriculture Secretary, um, and you know she's very forward-thinking on this stuff. And California now has a, a farm-to-fork program that's connecting local farmers to schools and doing institutional buying. And we're working on a bill to extend that to seniors. Um, but at the federal level, I mean, I, I think there was mixed feeling about him. Um, but we are so the California Food is Medicine Coalition or the, the Food is Medicine Coalition nationally is definitely working on, um, you know, kind of a policy agenda for the Biden-Harris administration around this. Um, we work really closely with Congressman McGovern in Massachusetts, like I mentioned. There is a, he has been leading for years, a hunger task force in the House, and now there is a Food is Medicine working group under that. Um, doing work. And so, and, and Rockefeller is also really interested in leading work um, with the, I think what's, what's, I think the opening right now in the Biden administration is that they are, if you hear their language, they're actively talking about economic security, climate, health equity as like a layered set of solutions. Um, and, and I think that that is where the shift has to happen, right? Is that these aren't disjointed, but if we're yeah. going to bring back jobs, we have to bring back jobs in a way that supports a healthy climate, 
that means our food system has to be, you know, it's like there's a there's an intersection happening there. I, I don't know enough about Vilsack, um, but I think there are lots of coalitions that are getting together to figure out how to lobby during this administration because we have an opening right now. I, I thoroughly agree with you. Yeah. yeah. Um, again, from Mandy, have you, uh, what have you learned um, as you built out your affiliate program? What are the challenges of spreading your model? Yeah. So <laughs> my bottom line is our affiliates are successful if they have passionate, committed leadership that understands how to build a community of support. So, you know, when you're starting an organization in a community, and when you're running a nonprofit, as, as many of you may know, you, you're, you're developing the program, you're getting the program off the ground. For that program to be sustainable, you also have to be building a community of support, volunteers and funders who are going to, you know, who are going to support that problem, pro program long term. We have been most successful when there's passionate, committed leadership that's well networked in a community and, and really um, understands the critical role of, of building, building and nurturing that community of support. Um, really, that's the, that's the bottom line. And, and we, you know, we have, we support programs in Nashville, Eugene, Oregon, Hartford, Connecticut, um, Grand Rapids, outside Chicago, you know, many, many different kinds of communities in many different parts of the country. Um, you know, people used to say to me at the beginning when I started, it's like, well, of course you could do that in Northern California. Like, you know, of course. And I was like, well, you know, we've got a program in Nashville um, because the reality is everyone everywhere in the country now understands that what they eat matters for their health. And when people are sick, they want the best quality food. We're doing 100% organic meals in, in Nashville and clients say the same thing like, oh my God, I was so happy that my husband had access to healthy organic food when he was going through cancer treatment. You know, that's, we hear that in Nashville and Grand Rapids and, you know, every, everywhere. And so the, the listening for this program exists everywhere. Um, the question is, you know, is there someone who wants to be a champion? And, and then we provide lots of support. We're, we're deeply committed to the success of our affiliates and um, do a lot of work to help them get off the ground successfully. I think that's exactly right in my experience. If you got people on the ground who care, then yeah. it'll happen. If you don't, yeah. it won't. Yeah, it takes simple. a lot of perseverance to bring something into existence. You Help know? be a radical, you know, yeah. activist, you know, <laughs> come hell or high water. Yeah. Exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a calling, I don't know about you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so from Chris, if we could reliably measure nutrient density in food, where might, that be first valued in the healthcare system? Well, people make their food choices. I mean, you know, for the most part, we as individuals make our food, you know, make our food choices and spend our dollars on food. So, you know, I think it's really there. Um, while healthcare is funding interventions, they're not buying food for the most part, except for their own like hospitals. Um, so, you know, this isn't, I, I haven't thought about this one a lot, but I would say you, you want to start where it's kind of like organics. You want to start where you've got people that are motivated and have the resources to actually pay for a quality difference. And then you, then you cascade from there. I mean, you know, 92% of Walmart shoppers want to be able to buy organic if, if it's, you know, priced at a reasonable price. That wouldn't have been the case 30 years ago. Like you have to start somewhere and then you kind of, you know, things cascade. But I, but I think what I would say, you know, what I was alluding to later is that it's really critical that those of us who are having conversations in the healthcare space right now don't, um, that we don't not talk about food quality, right? That we, we have to, as we're building relationships and talking about these interventions and, and driving policy change, you know, every single comment letter that we do and all of the work that we did, we always add, you know, we always add stuff about food quality and the importance of investing in organic and sustainable and regenerative agriculture. Um, we never leave it out of the conversation, basically. And, we, we have to continue to do that because that's how people start being like, why, why do I keep hearing that? Like, what is that 
conversation about like, why should I matter? Well, you know, why should I care about that? You, you've got to lay the groundwork. You've got to plant the seeds. And then um, as momentum builds, you suddenly got a listening for something that wasn't there before. But it, that takes time. You have to, again, you have to be persevering about it. Um, we're not there yet, but I, I fully believe we'll be at the point where people are like, what kind of soil was that grown in? And, you know, what's the nutrient density of that food? Like, we'll get there because food ultimately is the most foundational thing that we do for our health. <laughs> All right. Um, what are you working on with Jim and Governor Mass that our environmental activists in his district can get behind? Who? Our group connection, Jim McGovern. Yeah. So, um, again, the, the key thing that we're working on with McGovern is the medically tailored pilot bill. Riley, you probably have the full name for it. Um, but it's basically uh, it's a bipartisan bill to fund a 10-state pilot of medically tailored meals in the fee-for-service Medicare system. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of work happening in Medicaid. There's progress in Medicare Advantage, but Medicare, Medicare itself um, is, is really not, nothing's really happening there. And so that's really the big piece that we're driving um, with him. And for those of you, you know, a lot of you are in Massachusetts, and um, I'll just say, that our friends at the Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation at Harvard and at Community Servings, which is the medically tailored meal organization in Boston, um, have done a lot of work over the last three or four years to develop um, the Massachusetts State Food as Medicine Plan. And, um, and there are many, many organizations in Massachusetts that are part of that coalition. And they are now, what they've done is kind of map all of the food as medicine um, assets in Massachusetts against where there are pockets of high chronic disease and they're um, now working on legislative um, asks around investments in food as medicine work in Massachusetts. So that's really, really exciting work. They've taken kind of a different approach to the state than what we've done in California, but really, really critically important work. And um, if, you're, if you're in New England, definitely look at that and, and see how you could help bring that to your state if, if you're not in Massachusetts. All right, from Deborah, um, are you working to integrate naturopaths into the healthcare system? I would assume that integrates herbalists and the broader community. I know, uh, you know, Harvard's doing some very interesting stuff with, with Ayurveda and, um, you know, Chinese medicine. Yeah, I mean, our work is not around integrating any kind of practitioner um, into, the, into the healthcare system. I mean. We, we work with clinical herbalists and we get referrals from that. We, we have naturopaths in our referral network and, and, and work with them. Um, but our work is not around, you know, helping clinical herbalists become certified health providers, um, but completely support a broad range of kinds of practitioners um, and approaches to, to health for sure. All right. Um... How can we get hospitals to provide their patients with healthy organic food? So the interesting thing is that hospitals aren't payers for the most part. So what we have to understand is that health benefits are paid for by health plans, by insurance plans. Hospitals are providers of care. They're not provide, they're not, they're not paying for services. Um, and most people who are in a hospital your health provider, your primary care physician is in a healthcare practice somewhere. They're in a health center or a medical group. And then you go into the hospital for some services and then you come out of the hospital. So um, the work with hospitals, so the work with hospitals is around what, what is the quality of food that they're paying, that, that they're providing in their cafeteria or their patient meals. And that work, um, for those of you not familiar, is being driven by Healthcare Without Harm. So Healthcare Without Harm is a national organization um, focused on the healthcare sector. And they started um, quite a few years ago focusing on toxic waste from hospitals. They have a very robust um, food program now, and they work with many, many, many hospitals um, to improve the sustainability of their food sourcing. Um, and it's really worth looking at. Um, so from the standpoint of healthcare systems that are running hospitals 
and are sourcing food for either patient meals or cafeterias. Healthcare Without Harm is doing a lot of work there. When we're talking about meals for patients as a healthcare intervention, then we're really talking about plans as payers for that. I hope that makes sense. And I would definitely, if you're interested in what hospitals are doing around food, which you know has a long way to go, I would definitely look at the work that Healthcare Without Harm is doing. They, um, they work with a whole coalition of like 25 hospitals in, in California. And it's through that partnership that both Kaiser and Dignity Health have committed to 100% sustainable sourcing uh, by 2025. It's almost impressive how it's all coming together so fast, isn't it? There is so much happening in this space. I mean, I hope that that's what you all walk away with is there's so much work happening in this space and it's, yeah. it's, there's a lot of momentum and a lot of energy and, and yet it's still very unformed in a lot of ways and, and open to being shaped. Um, and we, those of us who think the way we do need to shape it in the right direction. You know, that's really the bottom line. Like, you know, dig in, find out what's happening in your community. Like, you know, is there a veggie prescription program? Is there a hospital that has a food pharmacy? Is your hospital thinking about its sourcing? Like there are things likely happening in your area and if they're not, you should start them. Um, uh, there's a lot happening and yet it's still so, it's all over the map right now. Like people are way farther ahead, completely not in the, you know, that's, that's that, because we're in that innovation and change moment, um, which is really, it's an exciting place to be. But it really needs all of our voices. I mean, I think that's the that's the bottom line I want to leave all, all of you with is that we all need to raise our voices about this complete system and this complete package. And um, every single conversation we have is an op opportunity to educate someone. So really, really think about that and get involved in these conversations if you're not already. I was just asking you in my mind, what's your closing thoughts? My closing pitch. <laughs> I just did it. We got it. I mean, this is up to us. Yeah, it really is up to us. And, um, you know, I, I mean, going back to what I said earlier, I started a conversation with the state senator in California because I wanted him to change how he was thinking about our little program in yeah. our little two counties. And that yeah. has led to just like the, all of this work in California really came out of that conversation. It's like, you know, you you could do that too. It's it's like, like, you know, Let's see what I'm just yeah. yeah, I'm just me having the conversations that I care about, right? And and all kinds of things can come from those. So you don't, you know, I mean, five years ago, I I didn't, I could never have given this talk five years ago. Let's just put it that way. Like this is all stuff I've learned. Um, by being yeah. in this movement and by by caring about what was happening and um, going to conferences and talking to people and learning and and helping to develop the work. So um, that's available to all of us. And we really, you know, I would just, it's, this is a incredible moment of change in, in really fundamental ways of thinking um, and uh, to get where we need to get and to make sure we realize the full opportunity at this moment really is going to take all of us and being willing to have conversations to to tactfully but firmly challenge people about their ideas and you know I've I've been in rooms where I've said you know all food is not created equal it's food is either <laughs> medicine or poison like you know we we've got to own that and you know people are like ah! but, but you know you've got to plant those seeds like you've you've got to take charge of those moments if we're gonna if we're gonna shift things. Yeah. And well, um, Dan yeah. we Riley can provide the PowerPoint um, so it can get shared out with people. And my contact information is on there. And um, I'm happy to have people reach out if they have questions or you know things that they're working on. Thank you so much for your passion and your leadership. Yeah. My, really, my uh... pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you everyone for, for spending the time with me and for all of the work that you're supporting in your communities and um, keep at it. We just lost you there, but yes, <laughs> it sounded good. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, right. just good luck, everyone, and, and please be in touch if, if we can help in any way. Great. Thank you, Catherine. All right. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Bye.